but it actually does have two motors so uh, it's just amazing what you get for your money with this locomotive hi there everyone it's really great to see you i hope i find you well and today we've got a review for you and this is a really special model it's one that i've been looking forward to for an awfully long time and uh, it, this has been made possible by the generous donation of Garthian on the Monday Club in the Super Chat there. So a big, big thank you to you. And that's made the review of the Helgen Bayer Garrett possible. And today's video comes to you in association with our sponsor, Rails of Sheffield, and in particular, their wanted service. This is a service that allows you to trade in unwanted items of locomotives and rolling stock and get the best possible price for them, either for cash or for store credit to put towards something that you really, really want. It couldn't be simpler. Follow the links down below and when you do, tell them that Jenny Kirk sent you and you'll get a 10% uplift on your agreed valuation right through until the end of June 2020. So hurry and take advantage today. And there's some links down below. The DCC fitting of this model is also in association with Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories. So really excited to show you this model. So without further ado, let's take a look. <laughs> This is the model, the LMS Bayer Garrett. And you might be thinking, hold on, I thought that's a Helgen model. And it is, as down here it says, produced by Helgen. But it was actually commissioned by Hatton. So even though you can buy these from a lot of other model shops, in this particular example, I bought from Rails of Sheffield, it does all come with the Hatton's logo on the box. Now, I spoke to Helgen about this, just to clarify. And they said that because Hatton's had originally commissioned it and paid for the tooling, that was part of the agreement. So that's why they all come with a Hatton's logo on the box. It's a pretty standard packaging here, but this very much is the biggest locomotive that I have ever had on my layout. It is absolutely huge. But first of all, I'm just going to give you uh, a look at some of the paperwork that comes in this. And again, it's, it's like what we saw with uh, some of the Daypole models. We get a really nice, well-presented booklet with a lot of information in here. So we've got on the front the history of the Garrett and this is always great to read actually because it gives you an insight into the history of the model, sphere of operation, how long they lasted and what the ultimate fate of the class was as well. Inside we then got instructions on how to get it out of the box and you may think well duh but actually, it's such a big model that it is important that you don't just yank it out by the boiler or you will break it. And then there's information on DCC fitting, which we're going to come to later on with a full DCC fitting guide of this model in association with train o -matic DCC decoders. But more of that later on. There's also a few detail accessories here. Um, and what I'm actually seeing is a couple of little shovels and... Um, some other, I think they're fire irons. So just really little bits of detailing, which I'm going to just leave in the box, but it's nice to see that there's a few extra bits and pieces. Now, as you all know with me, I'm not, uh, I don't like to linger on the box. I leave that for other channels on the internet. So if you want to get a good look see at the box and the feel and the smell of the box, then this isn't the review for you. We're going to get this out. And this is the important bit, what I was saying to you about how to remove it from the box. The locomotive is in three sections because it's articulated to get round corners, just like the real thing. But it isn't permanently screwed together. So instead, you have to grasp it by the very front and the very back parts and lift from those. If you were to grab and pull from the uh, boiler, you would actually just pull it apart uh, because it's held together with magnets. Now you might be thinking, magnets? That 
that just sounds a really weird way of holding a locomotive together. But actually, it works really, really well with this. Um, they've got, they're fairly strong magnets, but there's also a spigot. So the uh, full locomotive aligns itself into that spigot. And then the lateral forces, when it's pulling a train as such, it can't just pull itself apart uh, because that spigot will hold the entire locomotive as one. Now, the livery that I've chosen to get for this, as you can see, is this really striking LMS Workshop Photographic Grey. And this is a livery that back in the days when uh, black and white film was much more readily used and colour film was... Um, a lot rarer, but also uh, I'm told that colour film, certainly early colour film, had a lot of difficulty in accurately showing certain colours, like certain shades of reds might have appeared a little bit odd on earlier colour film. And that's why the black and white film was used. And by painting it in this livery, it kind of showed off all of the detail and made it a lot easier to see what was going on. So right up until uh, probably pre-Second World War, maybe even to early BR period, I'm not sure, um, it was common for things to be turned out in this livery if they were going to be uh, photographed. The boiler itself is a really chunky boiler. I've actually, you know, if we ignore the front and back there, that's actually quite a beefy machine in the middle there with that boiler. Certainly it's a bigger boiler than I've seen on any other uh, locomotive and I guess it needed that because that one boiler was effectively supplying steam to two locomotives and that's where the advantage of the Garrett design was. You effectively had two locomotives permanently double heading but they only needed one boiler and one crew to operate them. And that meant that you had a huge cost saving in terms of locomotive crew. Maintenance as well was, uh, was much uh, cheaper because you were strictly speaking, maintaining one locomotive and not two. And uh, this unique uh, uh, Garrett articulation allowed these big locomotives to actually transverse curves that would have otherwise derailed a rigid locomotive of this size. And I believe that the Garrett articulation, he got the idea uh, by watching bogey bolsters um, transversing some very, very tight curves in a, a, a yard somewhere in Scotland, I believe. Uh, I'm just uh, going through that story from memory, but certainly it was one of those eureka moments. The model itself accurately captures the British Bayer Garrett uh, that built for the LMS. The LNER also had a single Garrett, not really quite so successful for them, but the LMS ones were successful. They did the job that they were intended for and they did it successfully right through into the BR period and really were only usurped as the 9Fs, the standard uh, riddles 9Fs came through and replaced them. But they did do a good innings, and it's quite sad in a way that none of these locomotives survived to preservation. And I think that it's a major oversight that uh, one wasn't claimed for the National Collection, because I, I think that preservation is uh, uh, much poorer as a result for not having one. Overseas, they were far more common. So these worked extensively in South Africa and also Australia. Uh, and I believe over in America, they didn't use Garrett's per se, but they had a similar idea with some of the Malays and the Challenger locomotives too. I'm just going to carefully turn this locomotive onto its side. It is incredibly heavy. It's got a die cast chassis for all three parts, it feels like. The boiler as well, uh, I think there's a lot of weight in that. And it has a 2662 wheel arrangement. So it's got 12 driving wheels on the track. That means that the haulage capacity of this in model form is out of this world. I have not seen any other locomotive come close to what this single locomotive can do. Up on Weir Yard, I've actually had it running with, well, I ran out of private owner wagons. I had 85 plus two brake vans, and there wasn't even a hint of slippage with this locomotive. It just eased that train round the curves, and I have every faith that at some point I'm going to keep putting wagons on that train until they come all the way round and buffer up to the front of the locomotive. And that'll probably be 
be in the region of 150 to 180 wagons. And I bet you that this locomotive will move that with the greatest of ease. The real locomotives were only ever called upon to move trains of, I think it was around 78 wagons, before actually the real limit wasn't the haulage power of the locomotive, but simply the length of loops uh, in yards and on the main line to be able to accommodate a train that long without just blocking the lines. So that, that became the actual de facto limit. This grey livery really does pick out all of the detail on this exquisitely. And I really love the way that the wheels, uh, they, they just really come to life with that grey and the black of the chassis behind. We've got pretty much all of the detail that you need factory applied from these sanding boxes, uh, the sanding pipes in there. And this valve gear really is exquisitely done. We've got all the fluting on the rods and they really are fine. I'd wager that these are absolutely scale thickness. There's no compromise here with um, uh, making them a bit thicker as we've seen in the past with certain steam locomotives. And if you're worried about these shredding themselves, I know that there was a worry with the first batch of these that came out for Hattons having some issues um, with uh, valve gear coming apart. I have experienced no problems whatsoever with these. And it has to be said, it appears that Helgen has listened to the problems and has fixed it. So you don't need to worry about that. The actual uh, crosshead on there as well, it's all metal. There's no plastic components in here and it really does feel really robust. There's no excessive slack on any of this. And when it's running, it goes round with this uh, sweet seduction that it, it just looks so um, hypnotic as it runs along the track. Turning to the underside, and I've got to be careful, it's just so heavy and big, I really don't want to uh, damage it. But I'm going to just try and turn this locomotive over and show you the underside, because it's got a very peculiar firebox, because it's underslung in this middle section. So you can see everything. It's a very peculiar design. And this is actually where the DCC decoder uh, lives inside here. And there's two hidden screws and this whole assembly pulls off. But we're going to show you that later. The actual pickups on this locomotive, we have got a uh, 12 wheel pickup. So all of the driving wheels also electrically pick up. And because of the length of the chassis of this, that means we get really good electrical continuity. We've also got these free swinging bogies on the front. And that's where the couplings are actually mounted. They're in a NEM pocket and these are slimline tension locks. And because they are mounted with the bogey. They have quite a good sphere of, um, of movement, which means that there's no issues with this locomotive pulling off uh, the track, uh, anything that it's pulling. There's also a wealth of detail with the brake rigging. You can see here also drain cocks on the underside of these actually quite large cylinders. I hadn't realized from the side, they kind of don't seem quite as big as they really are. But from underneath, you can see just how beefy the real locomotive was. And then we can also see this magnetic uh, connection that these locomotives have. I'm just gonna actually this bit, uh, pull it apart. So you can see there, it's still connected by a wire. And and that's why you have to be really careful. The wire goes to a plug that's in there. So you can separate these, but you can see down there, the shiny part is the really strong neodymium magnet. And then we've got a spigot there, which fits into that hole and that locates everything. But that's how this model is put together. And I can feel the pull on that neodymium magnet. There's no real risk that that's going to just fall apart in transit. And the other end is the same, but a little bit more involved because of the coal bunker to get that to come apart. I'm going to turn this back over and I mentioned that coal bunker. Now there's two different versions that Helgen have tooled up for. One of which is this with the rotating coal bunker. Now the reason it had this was because as you can see that is a pretty massive amount of coal. If it hadn't have had this, this rotating coal bunker to kind of move the coal back down to the bottom, the fireman would have literally had to have clambered in here and shoveled the coal forward and I, I guess that he already 
had his work cut out firing this uh, this big machine. So this would just have a, a small steam powered uh, motor which would rotate this a bit like a cement mixer and that would cause the coal to sort of roll down to the front and make it a lot easier to fire this locomotive. There's also a big water tank underneath there. That is a big die cast piece. Inside there is a motor and it's a really powerful motor. And I'll be honest with you, uh, when I first put this on the track, I managed to get one end of this locomotive on a dead spot. Uh, and for whatever reason, uh, one end of the locomotive didn't start moving and the other one was powerful enough to drag the other end of the locomotive skidding down the track. And then when we got all that ironed out um, and up and running, it's just amazing how much haulage there is in this. The other end of the locomotive again another die cast water tank. I've just pulled this off with my finger accidentally and actually what you see in there is it's hiding the screw. So you can dismantle these to get into the motors if you for whatever reason need to uh, uh, lubricate any of the the gubbins but actually out from the factory I found it to be pretty um, reliable. There's no sign of any kind of lubrication needed. So again, another big cast metal chassis block, and there's another motor in here. It actually does have two motors. So uh, it's just amazing what you get for your money with this locomotive. There's only one DCC decoder required. It's an eight pin decoder, and there is provision in here for sound as well. I believe it's got factory fitted speakers, according to the paperwork that I've seen, but you do have to source and fit a Garrett sound chip. Now I have seen these available. There are a number of manufacturers that do ready blown sound chips and when I say blown it's just the term for putting the sound files on it so they've got the Garrett sound files on but you'll have to buy those as an extra. There is so much separately applied metal detail on this it does seem that anything that could be made of metal has been made of metal so handrails, fittings, whistles, safety valves, this rotating bunker it feels like it's metal Everything that's on here, it feels like a really quality model. The buffers front and back are not sprung, but in all honesty with you, they do look nice. They're turned metal, very, very fine. And um, I'm not too bothered about them not being sprung. I feel that sprung buffers can be a little bit of a gimmick in this scale. So I'm not too bothered by that. One of the things that I really love about this model, these steps on the front, they're made of metal, they're so fine, but they're there. And they're actually really robust. It has them on both ends. And I just, I love that touch. I can't believe how robust something as fine as that is. The cab, I'm just gonna talk quickly about this. There's a lot of glazing. It's actually a fully enclosed cab. So it, they, even though it would have been hard work for the firemen, I guess in bad weather, these weren't too unpleasant to ride along in. The roof hatches are modeled open, and I guess some of that is so that you can actually see the detail on the back head of the boiler, and it is in there, so that does show that off. I'm just gonna shine a light in there, and you can see down inside, there is a fully detailed cab, even though you wouldn't really be able to see it all that well through the side. So that is, again, a sign of going above and beyond the call of duty with the detail on this model. The printing on this model is really exquisitely done. And we've got this kind of uh, serif numbering. So we've got the gold, yellow, but with the picked out with the black on the, the numbers front and back. But then we've also got the LMS and this comes without the serifing. And uh, so we just get this kind of flat, goldy yellow. And you can see actually the difference that the serif um, font actually makes in making that stand out. The grey is exquisitely applied and it's it's actually a really good rendition of grey. It's a kind of a satiny finish and it works ever so well. Not matte, not gloss, just satin. And I always think that that really does work well in these scales. 
The black again, we've got that satin black and the demarcation between the different colours is very, very nicely done. We've also got uh, a works plate there on the smoke box and I can't really see and read it with my naked eyes, but uh, it does look like under close magnification we're going to get uh, even more detail in there. One of the things that I really, really like about this is the working lamps. And these are turned on and off using the F0 function on DCC. And it's really great to see manufacturers making use of the auxiliary functions on steam locomotives when you're running them on DCC. I had erroneously suggested that the new Baldwin narrow gauge locomotive that Helgen are bringing out was the first that I'd seen with working lights, but it turns out that the Bayer Garrett beat that to it also from Helgen. And it really is a great touch adding that extra value to this model. I come now to the DCC fitting guide and to do this it's actually quite simple. You're just going to need a jeweler's screwdriver, a small uh, Phillips style jeweler's screwdriver and then gently roll the locomotive upside down and then there's just two screws there and there and then this whole assembly, pipework and all just grasp it and pull it out and you can see there that's the uh, firebox with the ducting on there that all comes away and what you'll see tucked away inside are the plugs that if you really need to separate front and back from the rest of the model they can be unplugged here we just pull them out and then tucked away underneath because I've been running this I've already fitted this with the Trainomatic 8-pin wired decoder and uh, it's a little bit of a tight fit in here. Just going to pull that clear. And I've never really seen this design before. The 8-pin plug is just on a wiring loom so we just get the 8-pin plug there and it'll come with a blanking plate on and what I've done is I've gently taken out the blanking plug. Do take note where pin 1 is. It is marked on this very, very slight board that's underneath. You can see there. That lines up with your orange wire. And the Trainomatic 8-pin wire decoder just perfectly fits in. And it didn't need any programming other than locomotive running number to get this up and running. Once that's all in... Just tuck that back down inside, tuck in the wiring loom, and then the decoder goes in as well. It's a very strange design for this. Uh, I've never seen this kind of uh, DCC fitting before, but it does work. We then need to make sure that these plugs are tucked in, and then just move that to one side. We just fit this back over the top and just gently fit that in place and get the screws in and this is all you need to do to DCC fit this so actually it's an unorthodox method but um, surprisingly simple nonetheless one thing you will find is that that neodymium magnet it really does love your screw so it's like what yes oh I'll have that I mean, the, the pull on that screw is just incredible. And there we go. So just watch out for that. But if the screw suddenly flicks and disappears, you know exactly where it's gone. So I'm going to turn this back over, and it's as simple as that. Now to the scores. First up is finish, and actually in this livery it really looks something special. I've looked at the photographs of the other liveries, the LMS black, the BR black, and the Helgen also do factory weathered options as well, ranging from lightly weathered to heavy weathered, and all of those do look really, really good. I can't actually find anything to detract from, so on finish I'm going to give this a 10 out of 10. Next up is functionality. Well, when this was running, it ran really well. I had it running for hours on end and there was no sign of deterioration or flaws. 
it never missed a beat. There wasn't even any slipping on the track. It was magic to watch it run as well because it was just so sure-footed. So on functionality, I can't fault it. Again, it gets 10 out of 10. Ease of use. Well, this is DCC fitting. It's a very unorthodox method. I found it strange that you kind of have to delve into this rat's nest of cables to find the DCC socket and pull it out on a set of wires, but it does work. It does strike me though that there's a lot of scope for that chip to get overheated if it's sort of stuck in a bundle of wires. There's no way for it to transfer some of that uh, heat away. Now I haven't experienced any problems with that but in the back of my mind it is something that I feel mm, it's a weird way of doing it. Why didn't they do it differently? I do like the fact that the model comes factory fitted with speakers according to the documentation and it does have some soldering points down inside there to allow you to actually take an 8 pin sound chip, get rid of the speaker that is normally hard attached to that and then wire those uh, sound leads to the PCB soldering points on the main motherboard to allow the factory fitted speakers to do their thing. It's a really interesting way of doing it. So for uh, ease of use I'm going to give this an 8 out of 10. Next up is aesthetics, and Helgen have captured this model perfectly. I really can't see anything much to, uh, to fault with this. Everything is where it should be. It looks like the photographs I've seen of the real thing, and the attention to detail is really nice, but it hasn't been done uh, as a compromise to uh, durability of the model. And I've had nothing fall off. It's gone round the track without shredding any parts. It really has just performed faultlessly. So on aesthetics, uh, I'm really going to just give this a 10 out of 10. I can't find anything that's wrong with it, so it would be insincere to take marks off just for the sake of it. Value for money. These models are available, um, I found them for down to about £200 brand new, and that actually is uh, a really good price when you think about what you're getting. There's two motors in here, Effectively, you've got two Mogul locomotives back to back. What would you pay for two of those? Certainly, you'd struggle in this day and age to get two locomotives for under £200. But yet, with the Bayer Garrett, you do. And it doesn't feel like there's any compromise with this. The weight is immense. The pulling power is immense. The grace with which it goes round the track is really, really good. And I think when you consider what you're paying for far smaller and far lesser locomotives in some instances, when you scale it up to a locomotive this size, value for money, really, I'm going to give this a 9.9 .9 out of 10. That goes together to give us a really respectable score of 47.9 out of 50, and this model is well deserving of it. I think sometimes Helgen models get a bad rap, and they don't deserve that bad rap, and I'm really pleased to add this Helgen model to my fleet, and I really look forward to more coming through from them. I hope this video has been really informative to you. Don't forget to like it, share and subscribe if you've not already done so. And also don't forget to check out the links down below if you really, really want to get one of these for yourself. And also a big, big thank you to Garthian who made this review possible. Today's video comes in association with Rails of Sheffield and their wanted second-hand trade-in service. Follow the link down below for that and tell them that Jenny Kirk sent you until the end of June this year, 2020, and you'll get an extra 10% on your agreed valuation. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Kirk, saying take really good care of yourself. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Michael Churchwood, Anthony Hunt, William Wade, Wayne Johns, Offshore Allen, oorail.co.uk, Tepic, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Peter Bolton, Brian Smith, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Judge Mortis, Gary Lewis, and David Quinn. Thank you. Without you guys, 
I couldn't do this.